they get the rise of a rich class in New York uh, that makes a lot of money on all of what's going on, and a large middle class population that's working in the offices and working in the, in, in the stores and the retail, at least as supervisors, and a lot of poor people. And the other thing that happens is that little old uh, south, that little old walking city of the 1790s and 1800, that breaks up. Things sort themselves out by function. And what you get is the, the walking city is no more. The city becomes a segregated city. Not so much black and white, because there aren't that many African Americans here at the time, but really segregated out by income levels and by function. So that the area around South Street Seaport becomes the port area of New York. And related to that is the manufacturers and the retail stores that are directly related to that. And a lot of the factories get built either on the lower east side or the lower west side along the docks because, and the warehouses are built there also uh, because that's the logical places to, 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 to build them. Uh, and <clears throat> so you get a, a whole port area. Then the Wall Street area really becomes a center of finance and banking. So Wall Street by 1860 is known as the place you want to go and borrow money. You want to get letters of credit, that's where you go. And, and other areas of New York City become specialized manufacturing districts. Uh, meanwhile, the people are sorting themselves out as to where they live. Um, the rich people, well, first of all, the poor people. Um, poor people are looking for the, the cheapest housing they can get because they're poor. Uh, many of these immigrants uh, are, don't have a lot of money. And what they do first is they move into places like the Lower East Side, you know, within walking distance both of the Wall Street area but also of the factories that are, and the port district that are near here. The Lower East Side has been built up mainly with private houses by 1800. But, and, and what happened originally was the immigrants would move into private houses that would be, say, a mansion, a three-story mansion, and that would be subdivided into, say, ten apartments. And each family would have maybe one room or a room and a half. Uh, so the house that George Washington lived in on Cherry Street, which is uh, a street that's now under the Brooklyn Bridge, I believe, uh, when he was president of the United States in here in New York, and when New York was the capital of the United States in 1790, he lived on Cherry Street. That house was actually subdivided into a whole bunch of small apartments for the children, for the for immigrant families. But the trouble with with that is that the housing stock runs out. So you have to figure out a way, well, how, could you, how can you build as much housing on the standard 25 foot by 100 foot lot in New York City? And what gets invented by the 1830s to do that is something called the tenement house, which is really as much housing you can build on a 25, standard New York 25 by 100 foot lot. And what it usually meant was a five, six, or even seven-story building. There are still some seven-story tenements left on the Lower East Side, which were walk-up buildings uh, that had a stairway in the middle that would have two apartments in the front and two apartments in the back. And the only rooms with windows would be either the front rooms in the front or the, the back rooms in the back. The rooms in the middle were dark and didn't have any windows. And you'd build up, as a five, six stories. You didn't have any, originally you didn't have any toilets in these uh, places and no running water. If you wanted to use the toilet, you walked downstairs and went to the privy in the back. And if you wanted to get water, you went downstairs and pumped it out of a usually polluted uh, pump. Um, so these were poor, the cheapest housing you could possibly build. But they were built uh, because there was this great demand for housing in New York City. And you can see uh, you can, and so what happens is, is that large numbers of tenement buildings get built all through uh, the, 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 the scuzzier parts of the city near the ports, areas that are flat land, that flood easily, uh, where the rich people don't want to live. So the lower east side and the lower west side along the port areas become the areas where you get largely tenement districts. And, and movies like the, uh, the famous movie that was just... Uh, Gangs of New York. I mean, they, it doesn't do it that great a job, but it does capture the feel of the crowdedness and, and how, you know, all the ba battles that went on between uh, different gangs of, of groups. There was a lot of crime in places like the Lower East Side. There was a lot of uh, prostitution. There was a lot of gambling. Uh, there was a lot of uh, drinking, uh, so on and so forth. So the movie captures a lot of that. 
Well, what if you're wealthy? Where do you want to live? You want to live in a nice, high, dry place that doesn't flood, uh, that has good drainage, uh, that gets the first Croton water in the 1840s. And what you really want to do is move up the middle of the island because that's the best land. And so the rich people start to live on places like Washington Square, Washington Square Park North, actually you can still see brownstones similar to what they live. And then Fifth Avenue, which starts at, at just south of 8th Street, goes, becomes the, the main, the prime residential area and remains so today. Lower Fifth Avenue was built up with bricks brick houses and later brownstone houses and all the side streets were and then you move up further up the avenue so you get to Gramercy Park which is where Lexington Avenue begins and that becomes a high class area by the 1850s. And so the people, the people who have money, the upper middle class and the upper class are moving up the central spine of the island. Uh, up into, as far up as uh, by the 1850s they're all the way up uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. I mean what's now midtown Manhattan, uh, say 46th Street, for example, between 5th and 6th is, was, if you look, they're, they're the old brownstones of the rich people who lived there in that time. Uh, and the whole central spine of Manhattan gets built up with these areas. And that's really why you start to get the first forms of public transit. Because what don't these people want to have to do? How did the working people get to work? They walked, they walked right. And the factories were usually fairly close to where their tenement buildings were. And in fact, a lot of the factory work was done in the tenement buildings. Uh, it was called sweatshops, uh, where yet by 1900, you had 15,000 tenement apartments were used as manufacturing sites. Uh, but the, the wealthy people don't want to have to walk an hour to Wall Street, or 45 minutes, it takes 45 minutes from Washington Square about there. And so you get the first forms of public transportation by the late 1820s. Somebody invents the idea of running what's the equivalent of stagecoaches up and down Broadway. Uh, and the French word for them is omnibus, which means carry all, where we get the word bus from. Uh, and so for 10 cents, I think it was, you could get on a stagecoach at Chamber Street and go up the roadway and you can get off at the Gramercy Park area and you can walk to your nice building. And so you, you get the first bus service, which was really a stagecoach type thing where you got on the back of the stagecoach and you paid a fare to ride and it was pulled by horses. Uh, and Three year, that was opened in 1829. Three years later, some smart guy decides, okay, well, riding on horse cars on cobblestone streets is sort of bumpy. We can put rails on the streets, and we can pull what are the equivalent of the trolley cars, but they're not trolleys, they're horse-drawn cars, they're called horse cars, pulled by horses along the rails, and that becomes really the main form of transportation uh, by the 1850s. There are horse car lines on all of the major south, north-south avenues, just like there are bus lines now. And there, there were horse car lines also on all of the east-west, major east-west avenues, east-west streets. Because Manhattan in 1811 is laid out north of Houston Street uh, in a grid system. So you've got these straight north-south streets and east-west streets, uh, and the horse cars do very well going on. And what it means is you can get by horse car up to 42nd, 50th Street, in about an hour, uh, going up and down Fifth Avenue or going up and down uh, one of the other major avenues. And that becomes the major form. There are hundreds of millions of riders a year who are riding horse cars in New York by the 1850s. And that handles the population growth also because Manhattan by 1850 is built up to about 60th Street. So a third of the way up the island. And it, it takes care of a lot of the problems of, of where people are going to go. And meanwhile, also, some middle class people have moved across uh, the river to Brooklyn uh, because the first, uh, one of the first forms of public transit, in addition to the omnibuses, and the, actually the first form of public transit was the ferry boat. And by, I think, 1814, there are ferries going from Fulton Street in Manhattan to Fulton Street, Brooklyn. And so Brooklyn Heights gets built up as what Ken Jackson, who's an histor uh, urban historian at Columbia, calls the nation's first suburb. You don't think of Brooklyn Heights as a suburb, but he says it was the nation's first suburb. So on, on the hills in what's called downtown Brooklyn on the map, you had ferry service. And there was also ferry service started to Hoboken, which was across the East River. Most, but most of the population is moving up the spine of Manhattan Island. And that's all fine until about 1860. Uh, but then the Civil War happens from 1861 to 1865. New York does very well in the Civil War as a finance center. 
Uh, it also does very well as a manufacturing center. It also does very well as a commerce center. The Union Army is it's, it's supplied in, in, in part from you know, manufacturers in New York City. And so New York continues to boom. Uh, but the trouble is, by the 1860s, the question is, where are people going to live? And you've really reached, I mean, people will commute as a general rule 40, up to 45 minutes to an hour. But if you go beyond an hour, people start to fetch. That is to say, they start to complain about things. And you could get to Midtown in an hour, or you could get to downtown Brooklyn by ferry in, in about a half an hour. Uh, but by the 1860s, you'd re reach the situation where the city's still growing very fast, and uh, they're running out of places that are accessible. Now, you can say, well, why don't people live up in the northern part of Manhattan? Why do they live up in the Bronx? Why do they live out in Queens? Well, if you lived in the Bronx, even in the South Bronx in, in 1850, and you tried to get to work in Manhattan, it'd take you two or three hours to get there. Because there were no horse cars that went up there. Even if there were, I think there was one that went up there, it would take a long time. Some of the railroads that are built, the, what's now the Harlem Line of Metro North, goes up to the mid-Bronx by the 1840s. And there are some rich people who move to the, the, the central Bronx and, and do commute to work on the railroad. But even that's, that's very expensive, and that takes a long time also. Uh, well, what happens when, I mean, one of the, and the, the main problem is that the, the streets of Manhattan are so crowded by 1860 that there's no more room. You can't add anything more to the street system. Just like now the average speed of a bus in Midtown is three miles an hour. Now, it was sort of the same way with the horse cars. And, and, and all, I remember all of the other stuff, all the freight is being transmitted by horse-run by horse -run wagons, and they're filling the streets, and they're competing with the horse cars. And then there's the horse shit problem, which is a major problem. We don't think of horse crap as a problem, but it's, it's a major problem because it dries up, and if you breathe it, you get sick. And so there's all sorts of problems. But the main problem is how do you devise something to allow the development of the east side of Manhattan. Central Park is there by 1860, so the east side of Manhattan or the west side of Manhattan, or traffic to Brooklyn and in Brooklyn. And what you have to do is think of something that doesn't use the current street system, which means you have to think of subway. a subway or elevator. an elevated line. You can either go above the street or you can go below the street. Well, London had opened the first subway in the world in 1863, which was a small line that sort of is like the Park Avenue viaduct here. It was an open area. Uh, and trains c connected one train station to downtown London. And so a lot of New Yorkers started saying in the mid-1860s, well, why don't we build a subway system? And the trouble with the subways uh, was uh, for a long time technological. Uh, electric traction, that is to say, powering things by electricity wasn't invented until really, well, 1879 it was first invented, but wasn't really used till late 1880s and early 1890s. So there's no such thing as electric trains. If you're going to run a train, it's going to be a steam locomotive. And the trouble with steam locomotives is they cause all the smoke. And how do you ventilate it? You could only do it like you did in London with a, a viaduct type of thing, or the Park Avenue viaduct here in the Bronx is an example. It's open so that the smoke could go out. But there weren't streets in Manhattan that you could really build viaducts very easily on. The Park Avenue viaduct north of Grand Central was the only real viaduct that was ever built in Manhattan. There were proposals to build viaducts, but they were shot down because the property was so expensive. Uh, so that was the main problem with the subway. Uh, and the other thing with the subway is that subways cost, on the average, five or six times as much to build per equal unit, per mile or per hundred yards or whatever, as an elevated line. It's obviously much easier to build an elevated line above the street supported by steel or iron and then running tracks over the streets than it is to build a subway because you have to dig out the street, you have to build the stations, you have to worry about signaling, you have to worry about a whole bunch of things that you don't have to worry about as an elevated line. Anyway, from the 1860s on, uh, there are always proposals that are made to the legislature in Albany and then the state creates a law where uh, people can petition for the building of subways. And the event, what happens eventually with these tens of proposals that are made and different people get different charters to build certain types of lines is that by 18... 68, there's actually the first elevated line in Manhattan that's open on 9th Avenue. 
from Lower Manhattan up Greenwich Street and by eight, the early 1870s it goes up to 30th Street. And what that does really, and some of the politicians try to, to defeat it and they try to, there's even a proposal by Boss Tweed who runs the city government at the time to tear it down because Tweed had an idea of building a viaduct that he was going to control. I mean, there's a lot of politics behind it. Some of it's been discussed in my book. Most of the standard history is so we discuss it. But the end result was that the people in New York decided that, largely for financial reasons, because it was much cheaper to build elevated lines, to set up a system whereby networks of elevated lines could be built. And what would happen is property owners along a street would petition for the creation of a temporary commission that would lay out, that was, would plan elevated lines that would then be bid on by private companies, and the companies would get 999-year leases to operate them. So, and under that scheme, uh, elevated lines were planned and built in Manhattan on 2nd Avenue and 3rd Avenue. There was an elevated lines there until the mid-19th century, mid-20th century, and on, on 6th Avenue and 9th Avenue in Manhattan that went all the way up to the Harlem River by 1880. And then from the 1880s to the 1890s to 1901 was an extended to Fordham, you had one of those lines, the 3rd Avenue line, came up through the mid-central Bronx. And then in Brooklyn, under, which was a separate city, commissions were created by the mayor of the city, and a whole network of elevated lines were built along the northern tier of Brooklyn, the older, now slum areas of Brooklyn, because it's the oldest and poorest <coughs> housing, are along those elevated lines that, that are in places like Williamsburg and East New York and Brownsville. Um, and they really, if you look, at and they're all built by 1900. Obviously, this map that you have is 1910. And what happens, uh, and so these lines are built by private company with private capital, uh, but there's very early on a debate as to what the fare should be. Now, the fare issue is something we should talk about later. Uh, I don't know of any other city in the world where the transit fare has become such a hot political issue, but it's been a hot political issue for 150 years. That is to say, the fare should be cheap. And what meant cheap from the 1880s to 1948 was five cents. And the fare, in fact, was lowered to five cents in the 1880s, and it was mandated that the first subway, when it was built, would have a five cent fare. Well, that, as you'll, as you'll see, set uh, the stage for why the city got involved in building subway systems. Because these elevated lines are built rather cheaply, they do allow the population to spread up the east side of Manhattan. So tenement buildings that were built up in the Lower East Side, they're built up all along 2nd and 3rd Avenue. A lot of the buildings that were now, have now been converted to upscale apartment houses, not the new buildings where they've torn down the tenements and built up high-rises, but in the middle of the blocks, buildings that were tenement buildings that they converted to sort of apartment houses. They were where poor working people lived, like Germans and Irish and all of different groups. When I grew up in the 50s, there were still Czechs in the 70s and Germans in the 80s. And Italians and, I Italians and Jews were in East Harlem. They were all along the tenement districts built up along the 2nd and 3rd Avenue. Well, and then the same thing happened in the southern part of the Bronx, along the 3rd Avenue spine. If you look at the, where the 200,000 people who were in the Bronx, uh, Bronx, the 201,000 people in the Bronx in 1900, they're along the 3rd Avenue spine, right along the 3rd, along the 3rd Avenue well. If you look at old maps of the Bronx, that's where the development is, and that's where the factories are, and that's where the 18 breweries run by the Germans are. The East Bronx is empty. This part of the Bronx is basically empty because it doesn't have direct rapid transit lines. So the elevated lines allow the development of the east side of Manhattan and the west side of Manhattan they also allow certain parts of Manhattan to continue to develop as upscale areas so that the, the spine in the central part and up Fifth Avenue and up the west side also on, on places like uh, Riverside Drive continues as upscale areas. Uh, but most people in 1900 in New York are living in tenement houses defined by the tenement house law. And Manhattan by 1900 up to uh, Central Harlem at least is built up as wall-to-wall -wall masonry, that is to say there's, every building is right next to each other. There's, not, there's no type of suburban thing where there are private houses scattered among the apartment houses, like you get it even in this part of the Bronx. You get wall-to-wall -wall masonry. It's either brick or stone or steel buildings, one after the other, block after the block, block after block. Very crowded. <laughs> so much so that, as we'll see, parts of New York, like the Lower East Side, but also many other parts of New York, have become the most densely populated parts of the whole world by 1900-1910. Uh, there are 600,000 people 
uh, by one definition on the Lower East Side, two square miles in 1910, 600,000 people. The Bronx, if it was at that population density, uh, which is 41 square miles, would have 13 million people, 10 times as many people as it has now. The Bronx has about a million, 300,000 something people. If it, if it was built to the density of what the Lower East Side was in 1910, it would have 13 million people. So you can see how dense the Lower East Side was. Well, but the population did disperse. I mean, if you look at where the centers of population are in 1900, 1910, they're along these elevated lines in Brooklyn. That's one of the reasons, if you look at the population number for Brooklyn, Brooklyn's population starts to rise in the, in the 1870s very rapidly, and Brooklyn has over a million people itself by 1900. Whereas a place like Queens, which doesn't have any rapid transit lines and it's sort of isolated, really doesn't grow very much. It only has 153,000 people in 1900, whereas over a million in Brooklyn. Okay, so the private sector took care of it. And then, in the late 1880s, when electric traction becomes a reality, it's invented by Siemens, a company that still exists in Germany. And it's used, electricity is used to power trolley cars in many cities by 1890, and then elevated lines are converted from steam locomotives to, to electricity in the 1890s, and most of them electrified by 1905 or so. Uh, it's clear that now a subway should be a possibility of, in New York. And London had pioneered the way, London had built the whole network of underground lines, the tube lines, which are really tubes, they're deep tunnels under the city streets. They took advantage of the electric technology. And New Yorkers wanted, if they were going to be a world city, and the business community saw New York as a world city by 1890, New York also had to build a subway. So what New York did was it said, okay, how are we going to build subways? And what they did was they created something called the Rapid Transit Commission. It's actually called the Board of Rapid Transit Railroad Commissioners or something like that. And what this commission was, was a permanent body headed by an engineer called William Barclay Parsons, who's a famous, one of the probably most famous engineers in American history. Uh, and the, the task of that public body was to lay out, that is to say, plan rapid transit lines uh, and then go out to build, bid to the private sector. This commission was created in 1891, uh, and then the private sector would, would, would lease them, would build them and lease them for, for long periods of time. Uh, but the private sector, the private companies would have very long-term leases on these lines. Uh, well, Parsons lays out a network of rapid transit lines, including one on the east side of Manhattan, up Lexington Avenue, and one on the west side of Manhattan, up Broadway. Uh, and they go out to bid to the private sector. Uh, and uh, the other stipulation of this contract is going to be that the fare has to be five cents. Uh, and what happens? The private sector isn't interested. It basically tells the Rapid Transit Board that if you want us to build a network of subway lines, you're going to have to let the fare be a lot more than five cents because we can't make a profit at five cents. And people say, well, you made profit on the elevated lines. Well, no, the elevated lines are much cheaper to build. All right. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, was the, the London Underground uh, system financed the same way? Uh, no, I think the London Underground was actually financed uh, through the 1920s by the private sector completely. But the London, I, I'm, I, that's a good question. I should find out uh, the answer to that because I, I don't know what the fares are in, in London were back in 1900. The fare in London right now to go the equivalent distance to New York is more than twice what it is in, in New York City. And they have distance-based fares in London. So you, if you go further out, like if you go to a place like the Bronx, it will cost you five times as much as one subway ride does here. Uh, so I'm not sure of that, but I, I, don't, I have a few histories of rapid transit uh, in London at home, but they don't really talk about the finance, and I, my understanding is it was done by the private sector. Well, what happens in the United States if uh, the private sector doesn't want to do something? It doesn't get done. Huh? It doesn't get done. No. So a lot of times if it's important enough and the business community wants it, and there's also a lot of other pressure to do it, government, government does it. Well, no, the, the increased taxes was, was not a possibility, thank you, because everybody up until the 1950s thinks that subways and all forms of rapid transit should pay for themselves. That is to say, out of the fare that's collected, 
you should pay for all the capital costs that are required to build the subway, which are usually funded by bonds, so that the fare should pay part of the capital costs, or all of the capital costs, and that the fare should pay all the operating costs. So that the five cent fare was expected to, to pay to cover all of the operating costs and all of the, the interest in amortization on, on the money that was borrowed to build the subway. Well, uh, what happened was actually the Chamber of Commerce said, well, if the, if, if the, the subway is so important, see, that's what happens. If it's, if it's so important, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is that people convince people that, that the government should do it. So they actually went to the voters in 1894 in New York City. And they said, what do you think of the city building a subway system that will be leased to the private sector for operation for 50 years? And the voters, because they really wanted a subway system, voted overwhelmingly for this. And so, a, and they create a, an, a modified version of the Rapid Transit Board, still headed by Parsons. Uh, but they say, since the city is going to build it, it's got to be a relatively short system. So don't build too much. So instead of getting one line on the east side and one line on the west side of Manhattan, which was Parsons' original plan, they, they come up with a cockamamie plan, that's a favorite phrase of another planner named Bob Olmsted, who used to work at MTA with me, that goes from City Hall in Manhattan up to Grand Central and then goes across to Times Square and then goes up Broadway to 96th Street and then one branch goes up Broadway to 242nd Street, the other one goes through Central Harlem and through the central part of the Bronx. It's actually the first subway line that's on map one. If you look at IRT, first IRT subway, if you follow the dots, that's the first subway line. That's the line that Parsons plans in the 1890. It's only about 20 miles long, uh, but it does, uh, and because it, it is, there's a limit of $50 million as to how much it can cost. Um, but uh, they eventually go out to contract, uh, that is to say they go out to bids to the private sector, and, and a company that eventually becomes the Interborough Rapid Transit Company wins that bid, and that's headed by a financier named August Belmont. And so in 1900, a contract is signed with what becomes the Interborough Rapid Transit Company to build the first subway, uh, supervised by, by Parsons engineers. And they build that, and then in 1902, there's a contract to extend that subway line down Broadway and into Brooklyn to Atlantic Terminal, which is where the Long Island Railroad terminates in Brooklyn. So those contract one and contract two lines are actually all built uh, between 1900 and 1908. The whole system opens. It well, starts opening in 1904. That's why there was a big celebration two years ago that I was part of uh, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the opening of the first subway. But the first subway system really opens between 1904 and 1908. And in the Bronx, what's important is this central line through the South Bronx, which is now the two and the five line that goes up to Tremont Avenue uh, in West Farms. Uh, and the line up Broadway that goes up through, uh, <coughs> through what's now the Kingsbridge area of the Bronx and it's eventually extended to 242nd Street. The original plan was to end it at 225th Street. Um, and those are all open by 1908. And they do allow the dispersion of the population out to places like this, this area in the South Bronx that's built up with wall-to-wall -wall tenement buildings. Now, the Tenement House Act was amended in, 19, in 1901 to build higher quality tenements, but if you look at what's built between 1900 and 1915 along the first subway line, in areas like Charlotte Street, which allowed later burned down, it's walk-up tenement buildings that are really not of very high quality. They're better than the older tenements that, are, that people live in on the Lower East Side, because these new buildings have kitchens and bathrooms and running water and windows and light and air, but they're still walk-up buildings that are not of very high quality, and you still have block after block of apartment houses. Um, but that's where a lot of the population moves, uh, and the subway is seen as a major success. Uh, now, when something is a success in the United States, what do people want? More. More, right. And as we talked about before, not only the Bronx, but now, by 1898, Queens and Brooklyn and even Staten Island, which also wanted a subway, wanted subways. And so they, all the politicians go to the Rapid Transit Board, which is sort of a board like the MTA. In fact, this, this Board of Rapid Transit Railroad Commissioners, the lineal descendant of that board is the current.